of physics. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Simpkins Physics Corner. It's Mr. Simpkins, your host here this morning, with an insane roller coaster problem. All right, so uh, from the recesses, the dark recesses of Mr. Simpkins' mind, comes this problem. Let's kick right into it. Uh, at the beginning of our coaster, we have a mass of 0.2 kilograms, and we're going to attach it to a little motor, this little spinny guy up here. And the motor is going to rick, 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 rick. It's going to bring this little mass all the way up to a height. I've got cut off a little bit there, but a height of 10 meters. So I'll just write this again in case you're looking back at the problem. So as something is lifted, you're going to be changing its energy. Remember the big idea. When work is done, energy changes. This is the work kinetic energy theorem. In this case, it's the work potential energy theorem because we're giving it gravitational potential energy. If something's on the ground, it has no gravitational potential energy. And if you lift it up, it now does have gravitational potential energy. Where did it come from? It came from doing work because when work is done, energy changes. So the first question I asked you on the, the follow-up sheet here was what is the work uh, done to go from point A down here to point B up here? And the work is going to be equal to the change in gravitational potential. So we could just do that as mg delta y, which would be equal to, let's see, 0.2 times 9.8 times 10. And we can calculate that total amount of energy or total amount of work done. Same thing, right? Because when work is done, energy changes. And what we have found is that at this point up here, we have 19.6 joules of total energy to start with. As we go through the coaster, we want to keep two ideas in mind. The total energy in a system needs to remain the same from one point to the next unless there's work done by a non-conservative force. So let's go to the next piece here. Can I change colors? Because that would be really cool if I could do each part in a different color. Let's go to green. Why not? Let's look from B to C. So coming down here. Now, we noticed that our reference height from 10 meters was all the way down at the floor. So at point C, we're still above the ground. We haven't hit, uh, reached that zero potential uh, area yet. So, but we are also moving because we have dropped some. And the idea for conservation of energy is that the total energy before or at one point in the system is equal to the total energy at another point in the system. As I defined point B as the initial point, the only energy we had was UG. And as I defined point C as our final point for this case, we have both kinetic and potential energy at that point. Now, I'm going to put a little I and F here to indicate initial and final because sometimes when you have the same type of energy on both sides of an equation, people will get a little bit confused as to how to work that. You, know, you might put the same Y in, for example. But we don't have to do that. We're not going to be uh, noobs about this here. So we have MGY initial equals one-half MV initial squared plus MGY final. So on the sheet that I gave you, I said, what's the speed at point C? Well, we'd be solving for that VI right there. Now, you notice the mass is canceled, which is pretty handy. All right, that's pretty cool. And the GYF would have to be subtracted over here. Uh, and so we'd have GY initial minus GY final equals one half VI squared. Uh, and so we could kind of combine some things here together, I guess. We could be like G times Y1 or Y initial minus Y final. Uh, and then we could also multiply both sides by 2 to get rid of that 1 half. And then we take the square root of both sides to get to VI. So I did a few algebra steps in there, but you're big boys and girls in AP. I think you can figure out what happened there. Let's just double check to make sure that the format that I've put it in here is going to get us a legit answer. So it's going to be 2 times 9.8 times the quantity 10 minus 7.5. Don't forget the minus sign. That'd make a difference. And that should be a decimal. There it goes. And then I take the square root of that. And indeed, I get our answer key answer, which is 7 meters per second. So at point C, we are going 7 meters per second. The green work shows you the reason why we're doing that or how we got there. It's the total energy at one point in the system is equal to the total energy at another point in the system. Now, to get from parts C to D, you'll notice we go over this bumpy surface. And if we go over bumpy surface, we have friction. Friction is a non-conservative force. And so the total energy at C is not going to be equal to the total energy at D because there's work being done by a non-conservative force. How, however, do we set this up? Well, we do know that at point C, uh, we, we have potential and kinetic. But consider this. From C to D, does our potential energy change? No. All right, so what I'm going to do is maybe a little, a little shrewd about this. Uh, the energy, the kinetic energy at C, all right, plus the work done by the non-conservative force is going to be equal to the kinetic energy at point D. What did I just do? I just said, hey, we had some kinetic at point C, but we're going to bump, 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 bump. 
we're going to lose some energy to this non-conservative force. And by that, I mean it's going to be dissipated into the environment, not, not lose like it's destroyed. It's just going to convert to another form. But that's the work done by a non-conservative force of friction. And then those two numbers are going to add up to K. Now, we've talked before how there's positive and negative work. And since the displacement direction is this way and the force of friction is that way, if we go back to our work equation, work equals F, I'll call it FF, right, because it's the force of friction, times displacement times cosine of theta. All right, and that theta here would be 180 degrees. Do you see why? Because the displacement is to the right and the force of friction is to the left. So if I take the angle difference between those two vectors, I plug in for cosine of 180 degrees. What's cosine of 180 degrees, you say? It's negative 1. And so what do we actually get here? We get 1 half mvc squared. I'll call it vc to indicate the velocity at point c. But it's going to be minus now instead of plus. Did you catch why? Because cosine of 180 is negative 1. And so let's keep going. Force of friction is mu times the normal force times the displacement equals 1 half mvd squared. Now, man, wouldn't it be nice if the mass is canceled? Well, guess what? If you're on a flat surface, the force of gravity down, we've done this before, is equal to the normal force up. So instead of normal force here, I can actually write that as the force of gravity, which we know is mg. All right, and so, oh, cool. Now we actually can cancel the masses because we have a mass in every term. So I'm going to go ahead and sketch this like that. Get rid of all the masses in each term. Very nice. And, of course, what we're interested in is the <coughs> velocity at point D. So let's do a little algebra here. So we're going to have 1 half of Vc squared uh, minus mu GD. And then we're going to have to uh, multiply both sides by 2. That would handle this guy, right? And then we're going to have to take the square root of that to get the velocity at point D. So, again, I combined a few algebra steps, but let's just make sure that everything works out. Parentheses are very important here. Our velocity at point C, as a reminder, was 7. So I'm going to do 2 times half of 7 squared minus, uh, let's see, we got mu, which is 0.25, according to the diagram, times 9.8 times the distance, according to the diagram, is 2. All right, had that big old quantity. Got to drop the bars in there. And that's a beautiful thing when a plan comes together. The answer is 6.26 meters per second. Now, there'll be some cases where you are doing an energy problem and you're not sure whether the work is positive or negative, or maybe you put the work on the wrong side of your initial energy expression. Well, the common sense way to figure out whether your answer makes sense is just to ask a question like this. Well, I was going 7 meters per second at point C, right? And then I hit some friction, and now I'm going 6.26. I've seen students that get an answer of like 7.8. Right? You can't speed up if friction is taking energy out of your system as you define it. So just make sure your answer makes practical sense as you proceed on a thing like that. All right, I'm going to move my face over here because we've taken care of the top part of this. Let's switch colors yet again. Uh, and we'll see how long a PowerPoint can hang with all this writing on it. Uh, we're going from point D now to point E. So the next question I had asked on our sheet was how fast are you going at point E? Here, uh, let's, let's just make sure we're all clear on this. We no longer have 19.6 joules of total energy. Why? Because the work done by the non-conservative force dissipated that out or it took that out of our system. So we might have to rework a few things. What we can say for sure, though, is at point D, we are moving. So we have kinetic energy at point D. Uh, and we also have potential energy at point D. And uh, that total energy, of course, I want to keep my annotations. Let me do that. This would actually be nice because it won't have to store as much. There we go. Cool. Um, and then at point, I'll got to switch my colors back. At point E, we are moving. Excuse me. At point E, we are moving. And we also still have potential. Why? Because we're not on the ground yet. So we are moving at point E, and we are not on the ground yet. So that's U, G, E. All right, cool. All we have to do is plug a bunch of stuff in. So let's do that. 1 half MVD squared plus MGYD, that's the height at point D, uh, equals 1 half M, sorry, it looked really weird, MVE squared plus MGYE. Okay, lots of stuff going on, but check this out. Mass cancels. Every term has a mass. Mass can cancel out. And we are looking for the speed at point E. So I'm going to focus on this guy. And guess what? It's starting to look familiar yet. If you look back at our green example, all right, uh, it's going to take on a similar type of deal. Now, not exactly the same. Uh, let me be careful about that. It's not going to be exactly the same. Uh, can I get an eraser up in here? That would be pretty sweet if I could. I better take my time with the algebra steps since there's a lot going on. 
don't get a little overzealous with your simplification. Some of you people that don't like to show your work. So uh, let's see, we'd have one half v d squared uh, plus g y d, and then we got to subtract so minus g y e, and then we're going to have to multiply both sides by two and take the square root to solve for. VE. Boy, is that a beast. I'm going to pause and do some calculator magic for uh, the sake of time. And the velocity at point E would be 8.28. Now let's do the common sense thing, right? Does our answer make common sense? Well, we were going 6.26 meters per second up here at point D, and now we've dropped. And so if you drop, you lose potential energy. That means you gain kinetic energy. Okay, so that does make sense because we're going faster because we gain kinetic energy. Let's see what kind of other magical colors we can find. Let's do some orange here. From point E to F, it's a little tricky, but I did want to get to this. Oh, man, we have to get motor in here. I might have to make a super video for this one. Uh, from point E to F, what I'm trying to indicate is at E, you're, you're about to strike a spring, and then at point F, you have uh, compressed that spring as far as it can go. So kind of like move, 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 boing, and stop. And if that's the case, then at point F, we have a certain kind of energy, and at point E, we do. So let's look at the energy at point E. We just said we have kinetic energy at point E, and we have uh, gravitational potential energy at point E. But at point F, we have uh, we still have our UG. I'll call that UGE, and I'll call or sorry F, and I'll call this UGE. But we also have this is new now. We also have the potential energy stored in a spring. I wanted to throw a spring in here to show you what this might look like. So one half MVE squared plus uh, MGYE equals MGYF plus, and here's the new thing. One half. All right, K is the spring constant. X is the compression distance, how far the spring is stretched in meters, and that's squared. And so the bummer here is that we can't cancel mass because not every term has a mass. The spring term does not have a mass. Let me pause for some algebra to show you something. But right, if we're ever going to get this problem done in time, let's go ahead and look at the total energy idea. The total energy at point E was 18.61. If you don't believe me, you can check out the numbers I just plugged in. You can pause the video and check it for yourself. Um, so if we know this total energy, right, it's going to make our life a lot easier moving forward. Because from points E all the way through G, we're not going to be losing any from a non-conservative force. So instead of having to plug in all these one-halves and MGYs, I'm not going to have to worry about that as much. If we do that, though, right here, um, then we can take this one to the end together. So 18.61 is our total energy minus the uh, gravitational potential energy we have at that point is 5.87. Uh, that's going to get multiplied by 2 and divided by uh, 0.5 squared in order to solve for K the spring constant. So 2 times 5.87 divided by 0.5 squared is going to get us a spring constant k of 40. Uh, I'll just round it to 47 because one of my answer keys is 47. I'm looking at 46.96. It's all pretty close. Newtons per meter. All right.